Um, all right, Richard, um, again, back, I thought this was a pretty good fax. Um, the bottom line question was, how does Richard propose we test the theory of hyperdimensional physics so that we as scientists, this is one of them, can move forward with solid, reproducible scientific evidence for this new model? It's an excellent question. Okay. Oh. Um, I have composed a list of laboratory experiments going back now several years that are not very expensive uh, that we are going to, in the next several weeks, be carrying out. And we're going to, you know, list the experiments and then list the results. And in the next week, I am taking a special trip uh, to discuss with a potential, shall we say, collaborator. Okay. Um, the laboratory setup for doing exactly what the Thaxter proposes. That's on the laboratory scale. On the larger scale, one of the neatest things that really got me you know, into this whole thing was that we, we tripped over, Torin and I tripped over many years ago, 10 years ago now, in 88, 89, the astrophysical evidence that seemed to conform to the hyperdimensional model. And that was the locations on these planets all over the solar system including the sun, of the largest energy production centers being located at this 19.5 degrees latitude that I keep talking about over and over and over again. That's not accidental. That's a convergence of physical forces that are currently unmodeled by any known physics, climatology, geology, whatever. And what we have done in the paper is we have listed very specifically some key tests that we're now urging NASA and other NASA contracted astronomical facilities uh, to carry out. Pursuant to their announcement a couple weeks ago of this so-called new planet. Remember the announcement that came out the day after we did our hyperdimensional show last time? Right. Uh, of Susan Terraby, this young astro astrophysicist in Pasadena who set up her own corporation, the Extrasolar Research Corporation, and got a grant from NASA to basically look for planets around other stars. Well, she found, as part of her Hubble observing time, this funny little spark of light at the end of a long streak in a dust cloud ah, yes. of a double star system located about 450 light years away in Taurus, called, I think, TMC1, or Taurus Molecular Cloud Number 1. Mm -hmm. And what we've done in the paper is, using Susan Terabee's discovery, lay out when they, I mean, they are giving her everything in the kitchen sink to verify her discovery in the next couple of months, beginning in August, all right? They're giving her more Hubble time, they're giving her time on tech, they're giving her time on infrared telescopes. I mean, they're making everything available to Susan Terraby to verify that this is a planet. By the way, this is the same agency which has not taken any more pictures of Sidonia. Just want to put that on the record, okay? Um... So one of the things we're proposing in the paper is that if Susan is looking at this object and trying to verify that it is a runaway planet, there are certain signatures in her data which will become apparent as she takes information from the various telescopes that will either support or refute the hyperdimensional model as applied to that kind of planetary system. And so we laid out those parameters in this paper and they're there on the website. We then extended this to astronomy observations that could be made by NASA and or their subcontractors of major objects in this solar system, particularly the giant outer planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. What is probably not well known by most people, but they can know it if they go to the web, is that those four outer planets, the big guys, are all glowing. Remember the old textbook astronomy definition of a planet arc, that a planet shown by reflected light and stars shown by internal energy? Yes. Well, that definition has kind of lost its meaning, because beginning in the 1960s, astronomers were stunned to find that the outer planets are glowing. In the infrared, they are actually emitting more energy than they're getting from the sun, which kind of blurs the line between a star and a planet. And for the last 30 years, there's been a lot of discussions in the literature as to, well, what really makes them shine? Why are they glowing? And there are various explanations proposed, and we won't get into those tonight. The bottom line is that I've been able to take their luminosity, and there's a set of graphs in this paper, and I've been able to plot, like the old Big Bang 
uh, redshift plots that Hubble did, you know, 50 right. years ago. Right. And demonstrate that for some exquisitely inexplicable reason, by any mainstream model, all the glowing planets, including, by the way, I put the Earth-Moon system on that graph, glow on a perfectly straight line. Their glow is only dependent on one parameter, one thing, their total angular momentum, which is basically spin energy, all right? That's the spin energy of the planet plus the spin energy of any moons going around the planet. All right. You total those up, you put it on a graph, you know, X and Y axis, you get a beautiful straight line plot. In fact, the, the tightness of the plot is better by an order of magnitude or more than Hubble's original plot of galaxies that gave us the whole Big Bang model. Wow. At this early stage in this set of observations. So what I am predicting in the paper is, look, you want to test this model? The model says that the luminosity, if they're hyperdimensionally derived, will have one key difference with any other explanation that no one has yet tested. The luminosities should change with time. Both short-term changes, days, months, long-term changes, years. And because NASA and the guys that work for NASA believe that this stuff is cosmological, meaning it's kind of cast in concrete, mm -hmm. it's on a huge geological time frame, once they got the luminosities pegged down from the Voyager and the Pioneer missions, they never went back and looked. No one has looked at the infrared signatures, the outputs of these planets, since the 1970s. Because they think it's permanent. On a geological time scale, they're constant. Our model says, no, boys and girls, they're not constant. Go look at them next week, next month, next year, and they will have changed. Now, there's okay. one mission. Richard, these um, changes in luminosity, yep. are these changes uh, concurrent with... The changes we were talking about earlier, volcanism, uh, the weather changes, and all the rest of it, uh, is that what a planet goes through? Yes. Short answer is yes. Good. And because we... You like short answer. I like... I, so, do, so, do, so do people on the grassy know. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of correlating to be done here, and the neat thing is we have computers and the web so we can all compare notes and do the correlating. And one of the things that I'm looking for are a few bright research assistants... I think I've got one pegged already, to help me now flesh out the model. There's really neat stuff to be, to be determined here, and there's all kinds of mysteries that, if we're right, would, would be solved. I will give you one classic one, and it brings us back to what we discussed at the top of the show. Why are the Japanese interested in going to Mars? By the way, somebody writes and wonders if you are not interested, perhaps, in defecting to Japan. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, because I can't speak the language. And as you know, I like speaking. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and it would take you years and years and years to learn to speak uh, in the machine gun fashion in Japanese that you're able to do it here. Precisely. Mm. 